frequently considered the item most likely to ruin a Dungeons & Dragons game, the Deck of Many Things is an item both feared and coveted by adventure parties everywhere. Hey fellow Game Masters, I'm Richard Quiner, and welcome back to the Daily D20, your daily dose of all things tabletop role-playing games, helping you build your world and master your game. Today we're talking about a magic item that is kind of looked on as too powerful and dangerous to use in your games, but really, it seems just like a lot of fun if you play it right. The Deck of Many Things is a legendary wondrous item, so it's not going to be something that the players can just pick up at the local magic item shop. It's something that they will have to just find in weird spots around your world. So remember that if you decide to use it in your game, that they won't just buy this from anyone. The Deck of Many Things is a deck of cards that the cards are made from either ivory or vellum. And vellum is kind of a paper made out of a calf skin that they used to use, but we don't use anymore because... We have normal paper, but this deck of cards has either 13 or 22 cards, and each of those cards has a very powerful magic effect when drawn from the deck properly. In order to use the deck, the player needs to declare how many cards they are going to draw from the deck, and then pull them out one at a time. As they draw a card, the magic effect will take place. The thing about that, though, is if you declare more than one card, for example, if a player wants to draw three, then after drawing one card, they have to draw the next one within an hour and this again within an hour after that. So it kind of forces the players to draw all the cards. If the players try to avoid that, and they wait longer than the hour, then the remaining cards will be shot out of the deck randomly, and the magic effects will take place. So you don't want to take that for granted and try to avoid drawing cards because it's unavoidable. After a card is drawn, it just kind of disappears into nothing, unless it's the Fool or the Jester card, in which case those return back to the deck for later use. Now, in order for you to get an idea of how powerful this deck of cards is, I will explain what each card does, but only brief explanation. I won't go into details about the mechanics of the cards and how the roles and systems work that way. For that, you should really look in the Dungeon Master Guide. I don't want to be here as a replacement for the books. I'm just giving you information about this cool deck of cards. First up is the balance card. If you draw the balance card, your character's alignment is going to change, unless you're true neutral, meaning if you were evil, you could become good. If you're good, you can become evil, and so forth. The comet card starts a test for you. If you draw a comet card and then are able to beat the next combat encounter alone, meaning without the help of your adventure party, then you receive enough experience points to gain a level. The Don John card is pretty scary because you disappear and are stuck in an extra dimensional sphere until your party can find you and free you from it. The next card I think is pronounced Uriel, I don't know, but basically you're cursed with a negative two on all your saving throws until the curse is removed. The Fates card is an extremely powerful card, allowing you to avoid or erase an event meaning it's like it would never happen. So, for example, a death of a parent, you would be able to erase that event from history using the Fate card. If you draw the Flames card, then basically you've got a devil chasing after you. A devil is summoned, and he's your sworn enemy until you or it die. The Fool card, one of the cards that goes back into the deck, basically you lose 10,000 experience points, which, depending on the level, that could be multiple levels or one level. It really depends on when you draw that card. If you draw the gem card, you get either loot or other precious items that is worth about 50,000 gold in an instant. It just kind of spills at your feet. If you draw the idiot card, you actually lose intelligence. You have to roll a die, lose that intelligence, but the plus side of that is you get to draw another card afterward. So you could become stupider and then get a new card. Is that fair? The Jester card, another one that goes back into the deck, is the opposite of the Fool. Instead of losing 10,000 experience, you gain 10,000 experience points. If you draw the Key card, you get a free magical item. The Knight card summons you a 4th level fighter as your sidekick that hangs out with you until it dies. If you draw the Moon card, you get access to the Wish spell, which is one of the most powerful spells in the game but you have to roll a die and that's how many times you can cast the spell. If you draw the rogue card, a random NPC becomes hostile towards you. This doesn't mean it's an NPC in your area, it could be one on the other side of the world, and they don't like you. This can only be fixed with a wish spell, so keep that in mind and try to avoid NPCs that might hate you after you draw this card. The Ruin card is the opposite of the Gem card. Well, kind of. Basically, when you draw the Ruin card, you lose all of your wealth in the world. So any property you own, any items you own, except for your magic items, you can keep those. If you draw the Skull card, you're in for a fight right in that moment. A Grim Reaper will show up and he will try to kill you, and your party can't help. If your party tries to help, they will get their own Grim Reaper as well. So 
That's a pretty scary one that can put you in a lot of trouble real quick. Drawing the star card, you're able to increase one of your ability scores by two up to a maximum of 24. So this is one of the ways you could actually increase your ability scores beyond the 20 that is normally the max. The sun card will give you 50,000 experience points and a magic item. So that sounds even better than the jester. If you are unfortunate enough to draw the talents card, all of your magic items will disintegrate into dust. And if they are artifacts, they'll just kind of disappear out of your possession. If you draw the throne card, it's not a bad one actually. You get to gain proficiency in persuasion, which is great if you don't have it already. That's really useful. And then you also gain ownership of a keep somewhere. But the downside of that is that keep is currently inhabited by monsters, so you'll have to go clear it out before you can move in. The vizier card is a divination card. Within a year of drawing the card, you're able to ask it a question through meditation and get an answer. And the last card is the void card. This card sucks your soul out of your body and traps it in an item that is somewhere in the world guarded by some powerful creatures. Sure, a wish spell might help, but all a wish spell can do in this case is show you where that item is. Basically, it takes you out of the game until your adventure party can find the item and free your soul, and your body stays incapacitated until then. When this kind of thing happens, it seems best that a player would just have a new character and then can join in the adventure to save themselves along with their adventure party. As I went through that list, you could tell there was a lot of things that were really powerful that could really mess up a game. If one player at a low level suddenly drew a sun card and gained 50,000 experience, that would put them many levels ahead of their adventure party and would unbalance things to a way that it's not fun for people to play. That's why this deck is handled so carefully by dungeon masters everywhere. These cards are very powerful and they're scary and dangerous. And that's why a lot of times also, they're not really given to low level parties. I did give a deck of many things to a low level party. They kind of knew what it was, and so they didn't touch it, they put it away. But I did an altered version of this, where instead of having thousands of experience points being given, or big drastic changes, they were much more minor changes. And that's something you can also do as a game master. You can make a list of your own cards and your own effects that are not this powerful, and put that in your player's hands and see what happens with that. They might have some fun with it, they might not. But at higher levels, this deck of many things can definitely come into play and definitely make some interesting adventures. So for today's question, I want to try to make a deck of many things. So let me know in the comments below what spell effect would a card in your deck of many things do? And I will compile the list and we'll see what we get. If you like this video, I invite you to hit the like button and of course subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell icon to get notified when I upload new videos every day. And as always, Game Masters, I've been Richard Quiner. Thank you for watching.